I guess when putting together this series, first of all, you know, the idea of a century of violence in, invariably invokes, you know, which thinkers from the 20th century would we really consider? And to me, first of all, Hannah Arendt is one of those figures which has to be part of that conversation. To me, one of the most important, if not the most important thinker of the 20th century. And I think, especially when it comes to the context of violence. So I think that was, to me, was an evident place where we would turn. Um, and there's so much, as I say, that we can unpack with our rent. And I think we will get into the point which Anthony said um, in a moment around why the human condition. Um, obviously, it's great, Samantha, that you, you're happy to join us on this conversation today. And I'd like to start perhaps with, you know, um, also I should apologize for people who are online that this bizarre kind of uh, noise that's in the background. I'm actually in Heidelberg. I'd like to think it's the ghost of our rent kind of flickering behind me. It's probably more the ghost of Heidegger, given the kind of technological glitch that's going on. So, um, but I'd like to start with a, perhaps, you know, um, the, the book which uh, Richard Bernstein published a while back in terms of, you know, why we, you know, why we should read, read Anna Arendt today. And rather than giving that as a statement, Samantha, I'd like to ask you that as a question, you know, why Hannah Arendt? What is it about Arendt that so compelled you as a scholar? And why is it that you think that she's so relevant to the world that we are inhabiting right now in terms of when we, especially when we think about violence? Thank you for the invitation. It's um, a pleasure to talk with you. And I'm so happy that you brought up Dick Bernstein's um, book. And when I was going back through and rereading um, the human condition for our conversation today, I was, was thinking about, you know, what a great loss it's been this year to, to lose him. And I wish he was here having this conversation with us. He actually wrote a whole book about art and violence um, about 10 years ago. And that that that's a lovely note to start on. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, why the human condition? Why aren't we talking about the origins of totalitarianism or even Eichmann in Jerusalem when we're having a conversation about a century of violence? You know, I think it's the beginning of on revolution even that Arendt says, you know, this has been a century of wars and revolutions. And violence is so integral to so many of her works and the way that she talks about it is not always explicit sometimes it's implicitly embedded in the larger framework of the argument that she's making about the nature of political action revolution or what it means to even make the world in common to make things the human condition um is i think the most prescient an important book of Arendt's that we can read right now to begin to better understand what is unfolding in the 21st century today. One of the themes that she touches on at the very beginning of the book is the specter of technology, which already in the middle of the 1950s, she had a sense was going to radically transform the condition of everyday life and ultimately the human condition. And we are experiencing that right now. Um, she talks about so many things that feel like they're part of the fabric of our contemporary conversations today in this book. She talks about who we are, what we are, the creation of a waste economy, the collapse of the public sphere, the rise of the social, the loss of distinction between privacy and intimacy, the publication of private life in a social sphere. She talks about alienation and the ways in which alienation are ultimately transformed through the means of science progress in technology. And so, you know, hopefully I think we'll get to a lot of these things in our conversation today, but I always, you know, when people ask me what of Arendt's to read right now, I always say the human condition because, you know, when W.H. Auden reviewed this book for Encounter magazine when it was published in 1958, he said what Arendt manages to achieve in this book is to give us a vocabulary. She gives us a language for beginning to think about the political phenomena that we're facing today because ultimately she's a conceptual thinker. And none of these concepts are hard or fast or fixed, which I think is important to remember, but she does work with distinction, with concepts that are doing the work of distinction to talk about privacy, to talk about public life, to talk about labor, to talk about work, to talk about action, to talk about speech, and so on. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I'm kind of minded when you were just talking there about, you know, and I just think even the title, The Human Condition, it, 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 it resonates so much also to me with what Stuart Hall calls the historical conjuncture. And I think what our rent really has a real sense on, it, even in that very moment, is, OK, you know, what is really happening in the world in, in the most pressing ways? And But in a way that's very prescient, as you say, you talk about, you know, the questions of technology and alienation. And I think she already has clearly a finger on the pulse of not just what is happening, but what's about to happen in a way. And given that everything she kind of lived through to understand the, you know, that this wasn't, you know, the end of the Holocaust wasn't just an end point in terms of, okay, she could, could have so easily got wrapped up in the optimism kind of a, a moment and kind of said, no, the world is going to become more and more dangerous. And I think it's that moment of prescience that she has, which really marks this book as a kind of a moment in history in which we have to once again be alert to what's happening. Oh, absolutely. And just, you know, to add two things to that, this book is not optimistic. <laughs> um, you know, it, it begins on an almost romantic, what appears to be a romantic note. But when you start to dig into it, you realize very quickly that this book is not going anywhere good. Ultimately, this is a book about the loss of freedom in modernity. And Arendt is not hopeful that we are going to be able to save freedom mm -hmm. from the phenomena of modernity that has fundamentally transformed the society that we live in. And that's a very grave argument that she's making. And what you're drawing our attention to as well is, you know, the title. Arendt is so attentive to language. She's always so particular about the language that she uses. And there's a lot contained in the title of this book in itself. When she says the human condition, she actually means that word condition in a few different senses. She's talking about the human condition as it has been addressed in the tradition of Western political philosophy. And it's a conscious break from the tradition of social contract theory, of Rousseau, Hobbes, and Locke, who want to argue for an essential human nature or a kind of nature that takes over from the point of society, Arendt says, no, that I'm going to give you an understanding of the human condition and the fundamental activities that form the condition of ordinary life. And then she also means that in the sense that we are conditioned. Mm -hmm. We appear in the world, but we're conditioned by the world that we appear in, which becomes part of that human condition, which only appears natural. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I'm really struck by that. Well, you, when you talk about, you know, what she's really concerned with in a very pessimistic, well, it's not a pessimist, but it is a pessimistic way as well, but there's, 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 there's an out. <laughs> not hopeful. It's not hopeful, but there is a way out, I, I guess, in terms of, you know, but I think the, the question is, you say, you know, you, you, you talked about the loss of freedom. I think also implicit in that, and I think, again, this comes out very well, I've actually, in Richard Bernstein's book about, you know, what makes a Holocaust possible is precisely the loss of the human. And yes. the ways in yeah. which that, so I think the freedom and the human are inseparable in this. And I think that's the real pessimistic message from this book is that, yes. especially through technology, we are losing what it means to be human. Be human. Yes. Yeah, and, and, and that's the greatest violence. And that's why, to me, this book is so important in terms of thinking about violence, because yes. I think, you know, as, as, as Richard said, you know, there's this moment where what makes a Holocaust possible? Well, it's the denial of the human. And I think once we recognize the forces, the conditions at play in which the human is denied, then we have an entirely different conversation about what violence actually means then and now, I think. Yes. And I, and I think in the context of this book, violence has a very, she talks about violence explicitly in the chapters on, in the sections on labor, work, <laughs> and action, and modern worldly alienation. But more so, it has to do with the kind of ordinary violence that is in the dehumanization that has accompanied technological and scientific progress. Mm -hmm. And so when she's talking about labor, for example, which she distinguishes from work, she's talking about how labor is a fundamental part of what it means to be human. And it means to fulfill the biological necessities of life that make it possible for us to engage in other kinds of activities. That's not a bad thing thing for RN. Everybody has to fulfill the basic biological necessities of 
life. And in a way for her, that is a form, she says that's a kind of violence that we're all bound to. But the problem comes when some people try to expropriate the labor onto the laboring classes, onto science and technology to liberate themselves from the human condition so that they no longer have to fulfill their own biological necessities themselves, but can put that onto other people or other institutions, scientific, technological instruments. And this is where she starts the book. And for her, this is the part of that twofold flight the human away from humanity. We can't liberate ourselves from labor. I mean, this is part of her quarrel with Marx um, as well. You know, if we were to liberate ourselves from labor as a society, what would we be liberating ourselves to? We would be fundamentally negating part of what it means to be a human animal um, that is also capable of doing other things. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think there's so much to really un unpack with this, you know, yes. and this idea of being able to liberate ourselves from ourselves. And, I, you know, there's so much I want to kind of criticize here about post-humanism and autonomous Marxism and this idea of <laughs> labor as if that is some kind of idea. But before we go into any of that, you know, um, is there a particular section or chapter from the human condition that really has struck you as being very important in terms of, you know, your own appreciation of our end? Yes. And, you know, it goes back to the first question you asked me, you know, so I'm, it's, it's a great pleasure to actually read this passage. It's my favorite passage in all of Arendt. And it's the passage that made me fall in love with Arendt 20 years ago, when I first encountered her work um, in college. And it sets both the tone and mood and frame for the book. And and, and it reveals that I am a bit of a traditionalist and was trained as a political theorist, because of course that means I'm going to start with the first paragraph. I'm gonna read the first two paragraphs. It's page one of the prologue, if anybody's following along. In 1957, an earthborn object made by man was launched into the universe, where for some weeks it circled the earth according to the same laws of gravitation that swing and keep in motion the celestial bodies, the sun, the moon, and the stars. To be sure, the man-made satellite was no moon or star, no heavenly body which could follow its circling path for a time span that to us mortals bound by earthly time lasts from eternity to eternity. Yet for a time, it managed to stay in the skies. It dwelt and moved in proximity of the heavenly bodies as though it had been admitted tentatively to their sublime company. This event, second in importance to no other, not even to the splitting of the atom, would have been greeted with unmitigated joy if it had not been for the uncomfortable military and political circumstances attending it. But curiously enough, this joy was not triumphal. It was not pride or awe at the tremendousness of human power and mastery which filled the hearts of men who now, when they looked up from the earth toward the skies could behold there a thing of their own making. The immediate reaction expressed on the spur of the moment was relief about the first step toward escape from men's imprisonment to the earth. And this strange statement, far from being the accidental slip of some American reporter, unwittingly echoed the extraordinary line which, more than 20 years ago, had been carved on the funeral obelisk for one of Russia's great scientists. Mankind will not remain bound to the earth forever. Such feelings have been commonplace for some time. They show that men everywhere are by no means slow, to catch up and adjust to scientific discoveries and technical developments, but that on the contrary, they have outsped them by decades. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you know, it's, I don't think it's cited that either. I, I, I cited that same quote in my, one of the books, <laughs> I wrote, Liberal Terror, and I think it's such an explosive way to introduce a book, as you say, and this, What's and it? the questions, and I think the, the point that you're talking about there in terms of, you know, the question of, 
how that first of all revolutionizes the concern she later raises about the Archimedean point and the ways in which humans, in their attempt to escape from the earth, escape from themselves more and yes. more, and we become more and more, you know, and I'm wondering whether then that point around, I guess there's two points maybe you can, you know, offer your thoughts on here. First of all, how that, you know, I know Arendt talks about the moment that mankind, and especially mankind, can see the idea the idea of the world complete, that's when we know we can destroy it, right? So that is this kind yeah. of moment of realization. But how this connects, you know, the more you talk about that, the question to me is central to that, which is later picked up by Paul Virilio in the question of speed. So how, you know, what does it mean in terms of what she's talking about, the ordinariness of violence and how that's linked to the hyper acceleration of power and violence in the world, but also then how this, your understanding about how this connects to alienation. I wonder if you could offer comments on both speed and how that might connect to alienation in your own research. Sure, um, you know, this is, she comes back to this in the final section of the book on modern worldly alienation. And, you know, where you began and kind of, you know, reflecting on this remarkable passage is, you know, that kind of Archimedean point of being able to see the earth as an object that exists apart from us. And that, you know, she's citing Kafka, you know, that man could discover the Archimedean point, but this also meant a kind of self-destruction that these, you know, that this progress and destruction are twinned um, in her understanding of, scientific progress and technological development, which is being used to liberate mankind from the human condition, as opposed to improving the conditions of mankind. And so when she comes back to this at the end of the book, when she's talking about modern worldly alienation, by that point, she's traced a kind of twofold process, My, man's flight away from the world and man's flight into himself. And this two-step process for her is marked by cruelty and violence. It fundamentally rests upon the material, what she calls material wretchedness, the cruelty of the increasing number of laboring poor. And that's her language, right? And so the, the science, scientific progress has been used to exponentially create more and more laboring poor classes of individuals. And this ultimately has the effect of transforming what she calls the life process, right? It fundamentally restructures all of society into what she returns to as the waste economy, that we have transformed not just the, the world, but the activities, the things that are supposed to give meaning to our life into forms of commodity production that are endlessly repetitious, replaceable, and have no durability in the world. And Arendt comes back to this concept of, of durability quite a bit. And when I, I'm a very visual thinker, and when I'm thinking about this question of speed in the text, you know, and she's talking about how time has outpaced space, you know, never have we been more connected today through technology, travel, and trade than, in, and never have we been more alienated. And this follows from what Arendt is laying out in this final section on worldly alienation, where to, to an extent she's following Marx there, but she is very, she's very idiosyncratic. Um, you know, we can get into that or not, her, her bad reading of Marx, but is talking about the transformation of the world that we make with our hands, the world that we make, the institutions, the infrastructure, the literature, um, the apparatuses that mediate our everyday life have become these kind of constant turning over waste products that there's this movement so that nothing ever just stays. Mm -hmm. There's no durability, there's no stability in a world that is constantly being mediated by technological, um, I wanna say production and reproduction and this for her, I mean, the greater point to this for her is that it completely destroys the possibility for securing spaces of freedom mm -hmm. to come back to that earlier point, because the world 
and being transformed into nothing more than a consumer society is not a world. Mm -hmm. Because for her, worldliness and work are those enduring things that are bound by earthly time. Mm -hmm. We humans appear and we will disappear. We're born and we die. And our lives are marked by this linear temporality. And nothing can change that. But in a world where nothing lasts and everything is constantly replaceable, people have the desire to escape the earth altogether, to escape the human condition, to try to extend uh, their lifespan. I mean, we see this, we can bring it down and talk about this in terms of contemporary political culture. We see this kind of waste economy in the way that laborers are treated in our contemporary society today, whether we're talking about Amazon warehouse workers, or we're talking about the gig economy, or we're talking um, about uh, cheap uh, fast fashion, I think it's called. Um, you know, we see we see this um, unfolding. Long answer. <laughs> there's yeah, so no, much, no. there's so much there. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think it's really interesting because you know, it'd be it'd be tempted, but I think it'd be wrong to kind of say on the one hand, you know, what Arendt really dealing with in the historical trajectory of her work is almost like two different regimes of violence. There's almost like the exceptional mm -hmm. violence of the Holocaust, and this is you know the violence which picked up by like the, the likes of Giorgio Agamben, who you know, gives credit to Arendt in his theorization of violence of states of exception, the abandonment of law, this extreme violence. And then on the other hand, we have this violence which happens within law, this violence that happens within kind of, the, and, and it's a violence associated with the logic of technology and speed. But I think if we follow her work through, this is not so much just two different regimes of violence. She's already, you know, noting the ordinariness of violence in the Holocaust, right? And, and the ways in which then it's, you know, these things seep into one another in ways where, you know, the yeah. Nazi regime were hyper-technologizing everything, you know, and, and the ways in which the warning signs are clearly there for her. So it's not just exceptional violence and ordinary violence. No. Actually, the, the, you know, I'm thinking this then in the context of the idea of world alienation nation you know that if anybody knew what it meant to be worldless it was our rent you know she lived a worldless condition you know but then the way in which she's saying well actually worldlessness has just taken a different form and we need to understand that and i i think it's very prescient then and i think you know parallels I find with her work and then with Zygmunt Bauman's later around waste yeah. life, the figure of the refugee, you know, all these things really coalesce, I think is very prescient, as you say, in the contemporary moment. Yes, and I think you're right to say that it's not a question, or it's not simply a question of exceptional violence or ordinary violence for Arendt. She's talks about violence, even just in this book alone, in several different way she talks about as i mentioned earlier the kind of violence that is attached to the labor of the body in the realm of necessity um that things um are consumed as quickly you know they're made to be consumed and and disappear um and she talks about the violence of fabrication in the chapter of work all making requires violence be done to the earth mm -hmm. right and the earth she says is our only home and we have this responsibility to our earth because we don't know if life will be sustainable anywhere else. And yet all making is a form of violence done to the earth. And then when we get to the section on action, she's very attentive to draw a distinction between what is violence, what is power, importantly, for her, and then what is strength and what is force. And for her, for those who maybe haven't read RN, violence is mute, it doesn't speak, it's always instrumental, it's a short-term strategy, and it has a teleology, it has an end, and it can destroy power. For RN, power is not something that exists, it's something that phenomenally appears wherever people are together and act together in concert with one another. But all of this is to say that for her, violence is a part of the human condition, mm -hmm. right? And so if we try to attach any kind of extraordinary meaning to violence that leads us to want to eradicate violence from our lives in, in that way, it would be dehumanizing mm -hmm. in her account. But on the other hand, we have these political phenomena of violence. Mm 
right? And I'm using the language of phenomena because Arendt's a, phen a phenomenologist, I think, in, in certain ways. And she's talking about how things appear at certain moments in time. But you, you brought up the Holocaust, of course, the origins of totalitarianism. But part of what the work that she's doing is also talking about the instrumentalization of violence over time and the way that it is appropriated by political movements in order to achieve certain ends. It's not exceptional at all. Mm -hmm. It is, you know, as she, she jokes at uh, truth in politics, you know, like, why are we surprised people, politicians lie? Lying has always been part of politics from the beginning. Violence has always been um, a corollary, I wanna say, to what we would call politics. The question for Arendt is a question of judgment. It's a question of thinking. It's always about thinking for Arendt and judgment. It's a question of when do we judge that political violence is necessary? And how do we judge political violence that we experience, record, witness in events, political phenomena, like the emergence of totalitarianism in the 20th century? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I want to bring that up in terms of thinking about then totalitarianism in the 21st century, because again, I think, you know, the, the roadmap to thinking through this is precisely, again, through the human condition. And but I'm also struck about the, the point that you make about the, the clear distinctions she makes between power and violence. And I was always struck as very, you know, um, transformative in, as an idea, the, the notion that she presents that violence is different to power. And actually, violence is often the recourse from those who have no power. You know, violence is actually revealing of the impotence of power. Right? Yes. So it's the impotence of power which gives rise to violence. Now, I'm wondering how this we can think about this then in the contemporary condition and how this links to questions of materiality. Um, we talked previously about materiality, um, but also the ways in which thinking about the material conditions of life, you know, how does this call to violence now get manifested into a kind of politics of alienation and loneliness? And I'm interested in that connection or if there is a connection as you see it now between alienation, loneliness and violence from a perspective of feeling impotent to power. And I'm wondering whether we yeah. kind of work with our end through thinking, and I'm thinking very much about ideas of broken white communities today, especially, you know, um, where that kind of anger and rage is still so manifest today. Absolutely, you know, and just to, um... You know, I'm reminded of where Richard Bernstein started <laughs> with this conversation as well, just reflecting on how saturated American society today is with violence. Mm -hmm. um, I read somewhere that I think by the time a person's 20 years old, they've seen something, it, it's an egregious number, like over a thousand gun deaths on television, more than that. I mean, but, you know, in combination with the news, violence is in the air of American society, as it were, saturated in the in the media, in the news media. And, you know, I always, we were talking about materiality before the conversation formally started. And, you know, thinking about the dispossession of the working classes in the United States, at least, you know, I always come back to thinking about how, you know, we've had economic stagnation in this country since 1972. People don't move anymore. There is no class mobilization. We don't have a functioning social infrastructure or welfare system, healthcare, education. We have virtually watched all of our public and political institutions be privatized since the 1970s from the police to education and so on. And you know, part of this conversation is what happens not only when people no longer feel like they have power, but when people are experiencing a crisis of meaning. And I think that this is one of the things that Arendt really understood was that it was important to talk about where people get their meaning from. And so one of the things that she highlights in the human condition is that with the transformation of society away from the family, with the death of God, the kind of traditional institutions that gave people meaning, to a society of laborers, people were expected to get their meaning from work 
Well, what happens when you live in a society where people, where there are jobs or where there isn't labor or work that is rewarding or, but is punishing? Or what about the idea that that in itself is supposed to give people meaning in their lives? You know, we are experiencing a grave existential crisis in this country right now, which is manifesting um, in various forms of violence. When I went back to Arendt's lecture on violence and power from 19, 68, I was um, struck by one of her responses to a question in the Q&A where she talked about how the political party system in the United States is in large part to blame for the powerlessness that people feel because the democratic birthright to political action and self-government has been outsourced to the party system, which has become a machine which alienates the voters. And she says quite explicitly that that will eventually manifest in this kind of almost Machiavellian tumult violence that will disrupt society. And I think that we're experiencing that today as well as we watch the, you know, the Democratic and Republican parties collapse um, in front of our eyes and have been for the past several years. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting when you talk about and I'm really struck by that point about, you know, what happens when people feel like there is no work right? and there's no meaning to life because there's no work now i know you like you mentioned previously about amazon and again we can think about this in terms of the way in which the organization of the production of labor today is being increasingly automated and increasingly you know linked to new economies of production and it's not just the people now feel like there isn't work there isn't going to be work Right. And so the future in itself is an endemic terrain of isolation and loneliness. And in that moment, you think you can see where the seeds of violence, which our end would talk about, are so clearly manifesting already, you know, in terms of the future. And I think that's that's a real worry in terms of the pessimism of our end. We could take that much further, really. But, you know, I mean, anyway, she's not pessimistic enough to, compared to the contemporary <laughs> condition. You know, so. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, I think cer certainly not in various ways. And, you know, she talks a bit about automation toward the beginning of this book and the specter of automation replacing um, the need for certain forms of laboring. Um, and, you know, that still remains a kind of specter today. One of the largest employers of Americans is truck drivers. And, you know, we are perhaps or possibly moving into a future of automated vehicles, um, you know, what happens as the modes of labor are transformed by technology and people are, um, you know, not, um, I don't know what the word is there, or I mean, I don't want to say left behind because it's more, vi it is more violent than that. It, it's a mm -hmm. kind of, it's a kind of cruelty that doesn't actually improve the conditions of everyday life for mm -hmm. working class people. You know, I think you're right, because of the narrative of left behind means they can eventually catch up. And I think that which you know, is a myth. I mean, yeah. that's it's not no. <laughs> yeah. I know. So well, you know, I, I want to bring this back also then to the point that you made, you know, about um, you know, how do we then think, you know, and again, I agree with you in terms of to me, one of the the most important aspects of the human condition is to say, you know, that and how it applies to the contemporary moment, if we think even especially the contemporary left, if we can call it that anymore, you know, I think, but it's plagued by two kind of issues. One's the crisis of imagination and one's the crisis of action, right? And, and those two questions are central to the human condition. How do we deal with the crisis of thinking and the crisis of action? And I'm wondering how you feel that reads again now in the contemporary moment and the importance you attributed to thinking in Arendt's work. Yes. So one of the premises um, to this book, which she lays out at the end of the prologue, is, you know, probably one of her most cited quotations, which is that this book is about nothing more than to stop and think what we are doing. And mm -hmm. philosophically, part of what she's doing is talking about the ancient distinction between the Vita Activa and the Vita Contemplativa, the life of action and the life of the mind. And she is trying to raise them to an equal platform, um, as it were, um, that both of these are necessary to one another. For Arendt, all thinking moves from experience 
in the world and we have to think what it is we are doing, but to engage in thinking, we have to stop acting and we have to retreat so that we can have that space in time to reflect in solitude on our actions. And that's why I think in part, this comes back to a question of judgment when we're talking about aren't. So the loss of imagination, um, which I agree with you, Brad, um, is a huge political problem in our contemporary era. It has been a problem for a long time. I think there are different ways to think about that question through the human condition. One is, the fabrication of reality, you know? So if all thinking moves from experience mm -hmm. and all experience today is mediated by technology in some way, then the fundamental activity of thinking itself has changed mm -hmm. in the 21st century. So much so that our thinking in itself has become a reified object and that distance that is necessary to engage in Arendt's understanding of critical reflective thinking is hardly possible unless one completely separates themselves from the technological devices that control almost every aspect of our daily life. And so we have to, I think, pull back and start to think about the ways in which technology has transformed, not just the ways in which we think and the way in which that has been understood historically, but the ways in which we ourselves have become these kind of objects, even in thinking. And I'm always, I always go back to Adorno's beautiful sentence at the beginning of Dialectic of Enlightenment, where he describes it as a kind of threadbare thinking. There's no there there, as it were, in thinking. I think that's part of it. So how do we begin to think about a new political imaginary that is connected to and apart from technology. And this is one of the questions that I've looked at in the research on loneliness, because there's the statistics are really interesting if you look at the Pew Research Center on political action and technology. The more time a person spends on a social media platform, the more likely they are to feel lonely, anxious, and depressed. Mm -hmm. The more time a person spends on a social media platform, the more likely, three times more likely, to participate in a real world political action. Mm -hmm. And so these things are unfolding concomitantly alongside one another, both technology as a medium that could potentially help expand the political imaginary in the contemporary era and lead to new forms of political action that might cause or create change in a way. Um, but that is also, deeply, intimately tied to the alienation that people feel in our contemporary world. Now, I'll just say one last thing on this note is that, you know, Arendt emphasizes, and I don't think it can be emphasized enough, the need to be together in person. Mm -hmm. We have to physically be in the same space. Mm -hmm. And being together simply technologically um, is a, a problem for subjectivity. So much to say there, but I'll just leave, yeah. leave, leave it there. But yeah, it's, no, yeah. yeah, I agree, you know, and I think one of the things that we maybe we'll in through the pandemic was the importance of actually being, you know, in the company of others. And, and I think the also the point around, you know, and I'm, I'm with you completely about, you know, it's almost like we can no longer be alone with our thoughts anymore. We, we fear the solitude, right? We fear this, but the solitude that's necessary for deep contemplative reflection to really fundamentally understand the fundamental questions of the human condition. Um, now, I, 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 it's kind of strange. I think it's always a good sign, but it seems like the time has already caught up with us and it almost feels like it's just an introduction. So um, I think there's so many other stuff we could kind of go on to here, but I think the, just one final point I'd like to leave with before we open up this, just a couple of questions. And, I want to bring it just to your, you know, I'm fascinated by the turn to our rent and poetry. And, mm -hmm. and I think, you know, what is it that, you know, I'm a strong believer in the idea of the poetic subject anyway, and I believe poetry is so important to the idea of the human condition. Um, but what is it about the turn to the poems that really kind of captivated you? And was there anything in particular surprising that came out from the poems that you mm -hmm. thought, actually, this has such contemporary resonance in terms of her contribution to the world. Yes, we need, we need, we need much more time. Um, and, you know, the section on 
poetry and the human condition occupies a really interesting space between the end of the chapter section on work and the beginning of the section on action. Mm -hmm. And it is um, a really important part of the book. It's very disarming um, in a lot of respects when you get to it. Um, she's been talking about Marx and labor and what is a work activity and what is a labor in activity. And then she gets to art. Mm -hmm. She gets to poetics. Um, and if durability is what is lost in the transformation of society into a waste economy through the socialization of society, then it is the possibility of art and poetics that might provide some sense of durability in the world. And she says that poetry is the form that is closest to the thinking process itself. Every time you write something or make something, you're engaging in a kind of act of translation. But poetry for Arendt is a bridge between that life of the mind and the life of action. You know, I mentioned the Vita Activa and Vita Contemplativa, that kind of distinction. Arendt, one of Arendt's great contributions is that she adds a third category, which is the life of the mind. Um, and, you know, I always go back to this question that she wrote in one of her journals, which is, you know, gibt es ein Denken, das nicht tyrannisch ist? Is, is there a way of thinking that's not tyrannical? I think if Arendt had written out an answer to that question, it would have been poetic thinking. Mm -hmm. um, because it is a way of thinking that allows one to place things into conversation with one another um, without succumbing to any kind of reductive or deductive logic in thinking. So it's about creating possibility um, and the work of beginnings, which of course is essential um, to Arendt in this book as well, um, and the way that she comes to conceptualize natality um, as the ontological foundation for all political action. The idea that everyone can bring something new into this world. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I think the other understanding of poetics in there, you know, this idea that the poet, the poetic always speaks from the void where it's committed to the open. And I think there is something in our end that we see with that. So so I think there's so much more we could talk about, but I think we should probably invite Anthony back in and, uh, and hope, open it up to some questions. So thanks so much, Samantha. Thank you, Brad. Yeah, thanks so much to both of you. So yeah, let's just get diving straight in. So there's a couple of questions about convergences and divergences. So the first one from Jason asks, um, Aaron wrote, her essay on violence in 1969. How did that account build on or diverge from her account of violence in the human condition? Great question. Um, so in the human condition, Arendt talks about violence um, in the section on action, where she draws a distinction between violence, power, and then force, and strength. And I think that she unfolds that further in the longer essay on violence in 68 and 69 in the context of the student protest movements, the Black power movements, um, the protest at Columbia University, um, and, and what is happening more generally. Um, she spends more time talking about the distinction between strength and force in that later work, but she never, she doesn't, she doesn't move away from the idea that violence is mute, is instrumental, and does not, and the idea that violence is, um, that violence can um, negate power. I think what she emphasizes in the work on violence, which is very much a kind of critique of Sartre's introduction to Fanon's work, Wretched of the Earth, and Fanon's critique of violence in that work is this question I brought up earlier of judgment. And where, when is violence justified? Mm 
right? And Arendt never really goes past that question, but she puts it on the table because she's not nonviolent. She thinks that violence is absolutely sometimes politically necessary in liberation struggles. She argues for the formation of a Jewish army to fight the Nazis. She argues that Adolf Eichmann has to be murdered extra legally for his crimes against humanity, but she doesn't go there in her work. I would say those are the main distinctions. Brad, do you? What? No, but I'm just kind of taking from the end point you end there. I'm just you know reminded of her quote about violence can be justified, but it can never be legitimate. Yes, right? and and I think that's you know that's an important rejoinder to that in the sense where you know, of course we can always justify violence, right? And we can always say well there are just causes for violence in certain ways, and she herself you know would you know say under certain circumstances we have to acknowledge that violence becomes necessary in this moment of who would deny somebody in the Warsaw Ghetto from bearing arms to kind of resist, right? So, yes. and, and for her, but then she always says then, but it, we can never legitimate it morally. You know, we can never say, you know, that there, there's, and and I think that is where there's there's a kind of, there's a contrast with Fanon, but I think there's also a commonality with Fanon as well, because, because Fanon basically begs the question, you know, people think about Fanon as a justification for violence, whereas there's a very clear non-violent reading in Fanon, and Fanon's question is, well, what happens the day after the violence, you know, and, and I think there's a lot more commonality between them actually than differences sometimes. I, I agree with you in, in that reading. And Arendt's drawing this distinction, and it's a political distinction, between the violence that is sometimes necessary in a moment of revolt or revolution, and then the moment of constitution, of law giving, that gives form to a new political order. For her, those are two distinct moments, and there's something that happens between them. And that's why violence cannot be read within the language of legitimacy, which for her is political because it assumes the already constitution mm -hmm. of power. And we're, violence always, and violence is a form of damage, even when it's necessary. And mm -hmm. Arendt's, you know, and this is where, you know, part of Arendt's worry that she expresses in that work on violence is that, okay, even if violence is necessary instrumentally in order to um, dramatize a political problem, which he says is necessary sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. What happens if the demands aren't met? Mm -hmm. Then violence becomes a part of the fabric of the society and tears it apart. Mm -hmm. But she kind of leaves it there. She doesn't really go, go past that. But, but I guess also, I guess maybe she doesn't in the sense, because I think for her, there is always a counter to violence in the sense of all forms of violence require a political solution, right? And that only comes from acting in concert. So I think yeah. in that sense, you know, we can labor on the different justifications for violence, but if we can say, okay, there are certain moments in history where we would wish violence wasn't necessary, but it happens. But then the question becomes, what do we do about it? And she doesn't find an answer in violence. She finds an answer in the political. And I think that's where it becomes- In power. In power, in, yes. In, in action, in, in acting, which can bring power into existence, which is the only means for her we have to mm -hmm. stay, secure freedom. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. So I promised a second um, convergence, divergence question. So Brooke asks, um, how Arendt's thought in the human condition was influenced by Heidegger's discussions of technology. Where does it overlap and where does it depart from it? That's a huge question um, as well. These are, are great questions. Um, Heidegger's work on poetry and technology is, I think, quite present. Um, in the human condition, especially in the sections on reification, where she's talking about the object nature um, of the world. Um, and, you know, I think Arendt's greatest divergence from Heidegger is in her conceptualization of thinking and the way in which she is placing the Vita contemplativa and the Vita activa on the same plane with one another. I would say those are 
the kind of two most striking things to me. Yeah, can I just add one into that? And I think, you know, the, the point is that I think uh, Heidegger's work on technology is prescient in everybody after Heidegger. Right? So I think, you know, and unless you're kind of a technological fetishist, I think you have to engage with Heidegger's work on technology. So I think that, of course, there is the influence there. But I agree that Arendt also goes in a different direction to Heidegger as well. So, Thank you. So there's a in interesting question from... Um... Graham Tiffany, who asks about, or he comments, philosophy seems to be on the back foot in the sense that there are lots of commentaries on violence coming from biological, sociobiological, and genetic positions. He cites a book called The Anatomy of Violence, subtitled The Biological Ro Roots of Crime by Adrian Rain. Um, so Graham comments that these voices, these more biological, genetic voices, seem to have more influence on public opinion, for example, in relation to things like predictive policing. So Graham asked, why is this happening? Why is the biological and genetic frameworks having so much more influence? And what can be done to reassert the value of philosophy in shaping public policy in relation to violence? So again, a big canvas question. So I guess you just have to pick the bits that you want to pick up on. I'm not familiar with the uh, with the book. I haven't read it. Maybe Brad has. Um, and, uh, I. Why is philosophy on the back foot? You know, one of I think one of Arendt's projects, more broadly speaking, when she was writing in the mostly most of her work comes in the 1950s and 1960s is to try and almost rescue, well, rescue is probably not the right word, political thinking from the social sciences. And I think part of what your question is highlighting is the extent to which that attempt has not succeeded in many ways. And many questions related to the human condition, loneliness is actually a great example of this, are no longer really considered proper topics for philosophical contemplation or writing, but instead are the purview of public health experts and they are social problems that can be fixed or cured as opposed to part of what it means to be human. And I think this manifests in a variety of different ways. I think there's an answer in there to your question that has to do with the ways in which technology has transformed the way we think and the kind of illusion that the great oracle of our time, Google and whatnot, has given us that we can always know everything. And so the world around us becomes a sub, an object of knowledge as opposed to a, something, a topic of inquiry of exploration, of curiosity, of a desire to understand. Um, instead, we're just constantly fl flitting from one thing um, to the next. And philosophy um, requires, the work of philosophy, I want to say, requires something else. And we see that in the kind of making fun of metaphysics today as well. And yet those questions, those problems of metaphysics, are essential to thinking about alienation um, in contemporary life. Yeah, I think I think that question of metaphysics is so important, right? Because I think one thing that's happened has been the abdication of metaphysics. And actually, you know, metaphysics is now given over to people with Hubble telescopes, right? They're the ones who are asking all the big questions of event horizons and voids and all the, the fundamental questions which used to garner philosophers' interests. And I think, you know, we are now more and more operated in an introverted universe right where everything becomes imminent and everything lacks depth everything is just screen level surface and i think that's you know and i think your point about the time to think is so important because you know we can say well who has the time to think that's both a question and a statement right it, because it's like well who has the time to think but well you know well none of us right because i think that's the and i think but i think also you know in terms of the thinking about it in terms of the context of the journal anthony you know the the integrity of philosophy today is something that needs to be defended, strongly defended, because the you know the the, the lack of in you know the, the lack of interest, but I think it's actually more of an attack on philosophy and has been a conscious attack on philosophy. 
because it doesn't fit in with the technological world of things. And it's, there's no coincidence that philosophy, art, humanities, all those subjects which require deep contemplative thinking are the ones precisely the technologists go after. And I think, and, and, and if they can't appropriate it, they'd say it's just leisure time, you know? And I think that there is something that has to be strongly defended in terms of the integrity of philosophy itself, regardless of whether our end point about whether, you know, whichever circle of philosophers we belong to, I think, Okay, that was a, that was an important moment point that she made at that point. But today we just have to defend philosophy in itself, I think, which is a different problematic, maybe. Yes, and I think that just to add to that, Brad, I think you know that really hits on Arendt's point in the human condition about modern worldly alienation being characterized by this radical turn in toward the self where it's all about the individual subject and this kind of radical form of individualism mm -hmm. um, and the loss of the commons or the communal, which requires that kind of thinking, but also conversation with others in mm -hmm. a space of time. Yeah, and I, I think also just one point on that, you know, that's why we have sensed, you know, <laughs> talked earlier about you know, me being a Foucauldian, you know, but I think there's, there has been a very Foucauldian slippage where, you know, once we focus on the biopolitical and everything becomes about the body and becomes about the individual, increasingly yeah. that finds itself very easy, actually, accommodated with technology, the same of the ideas of, you know, I'm a great admirer of Gilles Deleuze, but Deleuze's work can easily slip into post-humanism in a way that really falls back in upon itself, where the metaphysical becomes something which nobody wants to entertain anymore. And I think that's the real danger of the slippage of the Foucauldian analysis and even Deleuzean analysis, I think, and that kind of slippage of all categories as well.